Welcome back to the Nonfiction for Life podcast, where we talk with authors who write compelling true stories and books with great ideas for living well. I'm your host, Janet Perry. Today we'll be talking to Seth Adam Smith, author of Your Life Isn't For You, A Selfish Person's Guide to Being Selfless. Seth Adam Smith is a best-selling, award-winning author and blogger whose writings have been translated into over 30 languages. Seth has been featured on Huffington Post, Good Morning America, Fox News, CNN, The Today Show, Forbes, and many other news outlets around the world. He's using all of his resources to prevent suicide and to help others fight depression. Welcome to the show, Seth. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Janet. We appreciate your time, and we're really interested in hearing more about your book. I want to go back, though, to November 2013, when you wrote a blog entitled Marriage Isn't For You. And many people know that post went viral. It hit over 24 million views in three days. And you mu- you obviously hit a nerve across cultures. Can you tell us what made you write that post in the first place? Well, um, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know if I can take credit for the success because it's, it's my, um, if you read the article, it's my dad's advice. And I don't come across as the hero in that article. It's really my wife who uh, exemplified the advice that my dad gave me, which, which she was just so forgiving. We, we had had a, uh, an argument and it was sort of a, one of those, you know, that you have in marriage where it's a slow build over time of this resentment and frustration and uh, basically anger um, because she was really busy in graduate school and, and I was feeling neglected. I mean, I'm basically I was, I was being really selfish uh, in my approach towards our relationship. And um, so after this really gradual build of resentment, I, I, I just got really upset and, um, and her response was very sweet, very forgiving, very loving. And it just reminded me of this, uh, advice that my dad gave me that, that marriage isn't for you. It shouldn't be about you. And if it's, if it, if marriage becomes completely and totally about you, that's when, uh, it'll start to fall apart. And so really the, the, what pushed this into the limelight was, um, Kim's forgiveness in that, in that critical moment, Kim's love and her response. And so I've, I had been writing on my blog a lot. I had been working on forwardwalking.com a lot and as the editor in chief. And then, um, that experience was so sweet for me that I, I wrote it down and and published it. I guess I, I, I hit publish at just the right time, and and then it, it, it caught on like wildfire. It really did. It was, you know, it reached over 3 million hits eventually. What was some of the fallout from it going viral? Befo- besides being picked up by a lot of news outlets, what was some of the, what were some of the other things that happened as a result? Uh, I mean, there was there was some negative uh, feedback. There was some pushback from, you know, different people, and and I, I didn't I didn't take too much stock into that. Um, uh, and then there was obviously the uh, just the whole radical life change that that came as a result of it. I mean, our our lives have never uh, been the same. Uh, we, we still maintain a, a level of, of privacy, you know, and. Hmm. Kim and I don't like talking about our our marriage so much. We we just we like to be very private. Um, but uh, but we certainly are uh, very active in in what we do work on. I mean, I uh, I write a lot about suicide prevention and depression, and and this you know the blog post going viral actually it was a, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to really um, push. Um, the suicide prevention and and depression stuff to really have that opportunity to talk about that. I'm so glad you brought that up because I want to get to that. Before we get to the suicide part, though, I I just want to kind of set up the structure of your book, which came um, a little bit later, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Um, Your father not only played that direct role in your viral post, but he also unwittingly helped shape the structure of your book. I guess when you were young, he read a story to you and your sister called The Selfish Giant from The Book of Virtues, which many of us are familiar with. 
and you retell that story in your book bit by bit by bit. Uh, what from that story, maybe just tell our listeners what it is from that story you're trying to underscore. Sure. My, um, like you said, when I was a, when I was younger, my dad read this story to us. It's by Oscar Wilde, um, and it's called The Selfish Giant. And and essentially, in a, in a paragraph, that that story is about a giant who has a garden, and a lot of people, especially children, come to that garden. And finally, the giant becomes so angry about people trespassing into his garden that he builds a wall. And you know, because it's a it's a magical garden, uh, when he builds that wall, it starts to snow, and the garden dies. And at the end of the story, he learns that tearing down that garden and letting people in, basically letting people into his life, is really the the only way to have a, a really fulfilling life, to bring light and joy back into the garden. And so mm-hmm. I remember my dad reading that story to me. I don't, I don't really remember my dad ever playing with me as a child. I remember him reading just this one story to me, so it really stood out. And then it mm. stood out even more. Um, that he got emotional as he was reading it. Um, and so it, it just had this really profound impact on my young brain to see my dad, this this really stoic sort of sort of person, get emotional while reading a, a children's story. And so hmm. um, in the book, I, I took that story, I broke it down into little bits, uh, and in each chapter I, I sort of tell that, that story. And... Um, you know, the main point I'm trying to make is that um, our lives, we diminish our lives when we build walls or when we push people out. Of course, there are healthy boundaries, but um, but when it becomes just about us and our lives, um, we, we really diminish the abundancy of life that we could have uh, if we let people in, if we share what we have with other people. And you were... Uh, So fast forwarding a little bit, you were 19 years old, a Mormon missionary in Russia, and thinking a lot about yourself and struggling, struggling with the language you were expected to learn and dealing, frankly, with pretty severe depression. Um, During one of your toughest struggles there, you had a companion named Eric, whom you call a gentle giant, which I don't think is is coincidental. So why don't you tell us a little bit, a little bit about Eric and what he tried to teach you about gardens and love and joy and things that you hearken back to in your book? Yeah. Um, Eric was, uh, a missionary from uh, Switzerland and he was actually, I call him a gentle giant. He was actually shorter than me. Um, mm. and, but everybody, you know, regardless of his, of his actual height, everybody looked up to him. Um, there was something in his demeanor that suggested he just knew what he was doing. He knew he had confidence. He knew what he was about. Um, he just had this light in his eyes that people gravitated toward. And I, I remember, you know, several missionaries saying like, this, this guy is the best missionary. Um, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe this guy has some knowledge, (laughs) some, some secret uh, self-help tip that he could tell me that would give me the edge as a missionary that would help me win over people um, without actually, you know, letting people in. Uh, something, something that he could teach me a little trick. <laughs> so I remember I asked him. I said uh, we were we were working together one day, and I said, um, "So, Eric, uh, I have to ask you um, how, you know, how can you be? How how are you?" the best missionary? How can you be the best missionary? How can you, um, I mean, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase. Um, you were just looking for kind of his secret sauce because you could see that he was successful and happy. Yeah. So, so I remember one day I was, I was working with him and I, and I asked him what it was that made him such a successful missionary. I mean, what was it that he was doing? What was the secret sauce that made him the best missionary and he was very thoughtful for a moment um and he said you know i i don't know if i'm successful uh you know and and at least by the standard that that i was implying um but he did say i remember this he said but i do know that the one thing that matters is that you learn to love the people 
And if you learn to love the people you're serving, then everything else will just fall into place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I thought that was BS. You know, I was like, no, <laughs> that can't be it. That's, that's a little trite thing that they tell you, you know, mm -hmm. like I want something real, but I was, I was kind of upset. I was hoping there would be something, something a little easier than just learning to love everybody. <laughs> it seemed like such a, a trite, fluffy little response, but he was right. He was right. Well, you figured that out later, but why at the time did that not resonate with you? I don't think it resonated with me because it wasn't the answer I wanted. Mm, um, okay. I, I, I've always had, uh, I've always been a very reserved person. Um, I draw a lot of strength from um, solitude, from hiking alone, from going on runs, being alone, on drives alone. I, I really do get a lot of strength from that. So I, I don't necessarily want to associate too much with people because I feel like it's going to drain me of all of my energy, mm -hmm. which it, it can, it, it does do that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, but that was one thing. And another thing is I, I just, I, I struggle, I have struggled throughout my life with, with chronic uh, bouts of depression. And, um, there's this, there's this feeling or the sense that comes with it, that I'm deeply inadequate you know, no matter what I do, I don't have enough to give. I have to hold on to what I do have because if I give away or if I share or if I expend energy, I won't have anything left. I'll be completely depleted. And mm -hmm. Like a place so of that, scarcity. A, yeah, there's a, a scarcity mentality, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, the subtitle of your book, A Selfish Person's Guide to Being Selfless, tells us where you're going with your ideas. And you talk in a brutally honest way, really, about going through this terrible depression and and uh, moving towards a suicide attempt. But first of all, tell me, is selfishness the biggest obstacle or stumbling block to having healthy relationships, in your opinion? In my opinion, uh, yes. Um, I mean, it's. I think it's just our tendency, our nature uh, to be um, self uh, preserving. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but when taken to extremes, yeah. And it, it will, uh, it, it will destroy relationships and, and eventually it'll destroy your life because really the most fulfilling thing that we have in life is our relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I imagine we have a lot of listeners who've dealt with depression. Maybe they're dealing with it right now and they think there's no way out. Would you suggest that thinking of others first is is always a surefire way out of depression? No, I would say that it's it's part of it. Um, but I mean, there, like in my case, I mean, I needed, I definitely needed uh, medication, and I needed to talk to a counselor and uh, therapist first mm -hmm. in order to resolve some uh, issues to begin with. But part of the recovery then uh, included reaching out to other people, uh, in a healthy way, um, not in a codependent way, but in a, in a way where I was, um, doing service for them. Um, that's, that was part of the recovery process, but it's not the way to recover. Okay. Can't, it's like a bad, recovery, it's, a, it's a tool in the, in the whole arsenal of fighting depression. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think that's important for our listeners to know, but, um, it is certainly one of the things that you propose in the book. What do you propose to do when someone trying to be unselfish is met with unrequited love, when they don't accept your help? Right. Um, I I would say that that I would say that that is good that you yourself are doing that. Like that helps you. That benefits you. Um, just by that act alone, mm -hmm. I know that my family did everything they could mm -hmm. um, to help me in in my situation during that period of my life when I was struggling the most. When I was, in my opinion, when I was being the most selfish, um, I know they did everything, and I did not reciprocate what they were trying to do. And it wasn't until years afterwards that I uh, that I thanked them for their help, you mm. know, and the, what was really helpful for me was 
that they just kept reaching out to me. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, the president of Anasazi Foundation, his name is Michael Merchant. He talks a lot about resolving conflict and peace. And he uses an, an example, uh, uh, he takes two chairs and he points them in opposite directions. So if two people were sitting on those chairs, they would be looking away from each other. And mm -hmm. that to him represented conflict. So they're not seeing each other eye to eye. And then he says, well, what does peace look like? And, and most people in the group say, well, peace would be both people looking at each other. And he's like, right, but you can't turn the other person's chair. You can only turn your chair. Hmm. And that's what peace looks like. Peace looks like you um, being open and reaching out to that person. And and that's the only that's the only chair you can control. That's peace. Um, hmm. That's peace for you. So I, and in the same respect, I think about that and in responding to people who may not be receptive to you may not maybe not for years or even indefinitely i mean it's it's a it's a ongoing process of continually reaching out that's a really good visual for all of us yeah. that's great and since you mentioned anasazi um you work for anasazi foundation now uh, what is the can you tell us the mission of anasazi and what drew you to that experience and that career choice? Um, so the Anasazi Foundation is a, a wilderness therapy program for at-risk youth and essentially our mission is to uh, repair that relationship between youth and parents or to bring um, you know children and parents back together again when we're, we're sort of an intervention program when that relationship between the parents and the children is so estranged or so damaged that you need a an intervention program. So, you know, what we do is we, we take at-risk youth into the wilderness for about six weeks at a time, maybe a little longer if that's what they need. Um, and they get away from all the distractions of the world and they get away from drugs if that's what they're, they're on. Um, and they detox from all of those influences and really reconsider their lives. And at the same time, uh, we do a lot of therapeutic work with the parents so that when the children come home, um, they come home to a different uh, environment and they're able to repair and work on that relationship with their their families. And I uh, I was introduced to Anasazi in 2007. I came here and worked as a trail walker. So I was actually going out into the woods with these, uh, with these kids. And um, it was a very transformative experience for me. It really... Um, it benefited my life. It was like seeing color for the first time, to be honest. I know that's, wow. that's really hyperbolic, but it's, it's, uh, it's true. It was really mm. enriching for me. That's beautiful work. Well, you've, yeah. it, it seems from the book anyway, you have had a very supportive family throughout your life, particularly mm. when your depression led you to attempt suicide. So maybe we could talk about families, from your point of view, how can families best support someone who is depressed? Besides just continuing to reach out, are there any other things that that you could share that would help people who are on the other side of depression? Um, apart from continuously reaching out, um, really a, a, a strong family, a strong family just does what they what they have to do. Sometimes Sometimes those responses are soft and sweet, um, and sometimes they're a little, you know, they're a little harsh. And if I can say that, they're they, they're true. Um, so, like my mother, she she was very sweet when I came home from the hospital after a suicide attempt. She slept almost every night on the floor, you know, and she's in her 60s, and I know she has back problems, but she mm. slept on the floor just to make sure that I was safe. Mm -hmm. My dad, on the other hand, you know, he, he did, he was very sweet. He did offer some, you know, some very kind gestures, but at, at other times he, he told me, you know, straight up, he's, you know, Seth, you're, you're being selfish right now. There are a lot of other people who are really worried about you mm -hmm. and you need, you need to recover, not just for yourself, but for us, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was, there were some hard truths, you know? So, um, a good family does what they have to do, what, what the, what the right, um, thing may be in that situation. And, uh, uh, it would be hard for me to, to give concrete advice, uh, 
for each individual family because all those situations are different. But, but I know in the case of my, my wife, um, I, I had an episode of depression in the early part of our marriage and I was really terrified of being in that place, especially so early in our marriage. And I, I just remember she, you know, she took me and took, she put both of her hands on either side of my head and she just said she was going to walk with me this whole time. And she meant that mm. metaphorically, you know, she would, mm -hmm. she would walk with me through the dark the whole time. And, and I knew that I knew mm. that she would, and that sometimes we can't pull people out of the darkness and mm -hmm. and when that's the case you know we just tell them that we'll sit with them in the darkness mm -hmm. if that's what they need yeah now some people don't have people they can trust or they don't have a, a family or a circle of supporters around them well, what do you suggest for them where do they go for a loving support group that's um, that's a very difficult question, um, but I have known a lot of people, especially in the work that I do right now, who find a lot of encouragement and support in um, Alcoholics Anonymous groups or groups that are similar, mm. um, and they don't necessarily have to be um, addicted to alcohol or drugs. If they just need a support group, I've, I've known people who, who go there and receive that and because it becomes this community um, and they, they look out for each other. So that's something that um, that has been as a resource, I think, is really good. But, you know, finding friends, finding organizations, churches, groups of people um, that you trust or individuals that you trust uh, to work with. Um, and if your depression is really severe, most people are terrified by this. And I, and I understand, but I, 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 I just want to reassure people that there's nothing to be terrified about talking to a therapist or counselor. Um, these people are trained. Um, they know, you know, what they, they see this kind of thing all the time and they, they know how to help people. Um, and I, if, if any, if anyone listening to this, this podcast is experiencing feelings of intense depression, uh, and is concerned about seeing a therapist, I can, can tell you right now that it, it is probably one of the most beneficial things you can do um, to quickly um, resolve some of these those feelings of depression. Great. Good. I think you've given some good ideas. Let's get back to the story a little bit, your book. Uh, a big part of the story of The Selfish Giant is about building and tearing down walls. So I want to just read a quote from your book, and then have you comment on this. Uh, in chapter six, you say, each of us has built walls of one form or another. They may be fiercely defensive walls built out of anger and hatred, or they may be, they may simply be precautionary walls built out of fear and pain. Some walls may be justifiable defenses built to keep you from hurting yourself or being hurt by another. But often these walls keep out more life than originally intended. I think that last sentence is really interesting. We keep out more life than we started out to. What, obviously you propose that these walls are limiting our relationships. They can even be damaging. If we have built walls, what helps us feel safe when we decide we wanna tear down the walls that we've built? Uh, you know, I think um, I th I think it's okay to to keep a wall up and maybe occasionally venture out, just mm -hmm. to see, just to make sure that everything you know is this wall justifiable? Is uh, do I need to change the way I think about things? Um, you know, for example, there was a, a conflict that I had with my brother who is one of my best friends um and that conflict went on for years and I, I don't even think he knew the extent of it he i i again i had been very resentful um towards him for for a number of reasons and i i started building up this wall and we just didn't hang out as much as we used to and and i remember he almost missed my uh, sister's wedding he he t took the wrong directions and went somewhere else and i remember thinking at the wedding I hope he misses the wedding because then he'll know 
just how much he's been hurting me and the family. Then he'll know. I'll, we'll have this reason to, to really hold over his head as, as being a, just a terrible person. <laughs> mm. And I remember thinking of that, like, as soon as that thought entered, I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> this is, this is my, this is my brother. Like, do I, do I really want to do this for the next, you know, four, five, 10, 20 years to push him out, you know, for, for that long? And do I really want this? Um, and then he showed up at the wedding and I, I, I had had this, you know, cathartic experience. I went up to him. I was emotional. I was like, David, I'm so sorry. And he's like, what? I'm, I'm the one who was late. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, but that was a moment of kind of going outside of the wall and, and reconsidering, is this wall justified? And, and in the book, I talk about uh, the the wall, both physical and, and metaphorical wall that we've had between uh, America and Russia, you know, the, the yes. Berlin Wall that was built. Um, and I, on my mission and, and after my mission, I've often wondered, is that, was that wall justified? And is it justified, you know, rebuilding that wall and, and building this barrier between the two countries? And ultimately, uh, you know, in the book, I I don't think it is. I think I think we as countries, as America and Russia, would benefit more from friendship, from you know, peace between our two countries than than war, um, than this Cold War that we constantly seem to be having. Yeah, you you're able to see the global view of the two countries, and then you also had Russian friends. One of them was uh, Galina. Maybe she, she's still your friend, Galina. Have I said that correctly? You said it. You said it correctly. Yeah. Okay. In your words, she taught you there is an indescribable power that comes to us when we choose to open a door instead of build a wall. So, Seth, just what is that power that comes to us? Um, well, I mean, it, it it invites others to tear down their own walls, and it and it it gives us this opportunity for friendship and unity. Um, and, and in reference to that that's, that story about Galena, in fact, I just sent her some messages this morning. It was, it's really weird. I haven't heard from her like uh, in a couple of weeks. And so we were started talking again. It was really sweet. And um, I remember she had, um, uh, she invited me over to her house uh, shortly after their first child was born, and their, their daughter. And, and I was, I was holding their, the daughter, just this tiny little thing, but she was, you know, smiling up at me, this little baby. And, and Galina was talking to me in Russian, though she speaks perfect English, but she was talking to me in Russian. And she said, Oh, look at that. And she said, she loves her Dia which is her uncle said. And I just, I just felt really sweet emotion. Just, you know, here, here's this Russian woman and her daughter, you know, she's saying that this is, you know, that, that I'm part of this family um, mm. that I would otherwise not have had if that wall, if that Berlin wall had stayed up. I would not know that sweet experience of, of being part of this Russian family that, that, that meant the world to me. And um, I, I think you know, we deny ourselves a lot of opportunities when we when we keep walls up that that shouldn't stay up. Opportunities and relationships, right? You had this relationship with her and also the family you went back to and uh, you, when you went back to Russia and, and visited, became emotionally connected to them. And I think that's what uh, one of the threads throughout your book is that you felt kind of a deadness in your emotional connections. And as you came around after the kind of the nadir with your suicide attempt, things started happening that were, you know, sparking emotional charges in your life. Really beautiful changes. Uh, let's Let's conclude by talking about light. You finished the story of the selfish giant describing how he discovered the transformational role of light. In fact, you yourself call the literature and lives that guided you out of depression your own northern lights of life. So 
Where do you turn others to find light that they need? There's this old Leo Tolstoy legend about um, light and, and these different people from all different walks of life and different cultures are meeting together and, and they're, they're describing, they suddenly start describing the sun and they all have different ways of describing the sun. Somebody calls it a, a magical, another person calls it um, a, a ball of fire in the sky. Someone gets really scientific with it. Another person is blind and says he can't see the sun. Um, you know, and, and Leo Tolstoy being who he is, being this, he's, he, he loved symbolism and stuff. So he, he describes how this is just different people's ways of interpreting, um, spiritual light. Um, and, and ultimately that's what I think. I, I, I think, uh, and I, I believe very strongly that there is a spiritual light, um, that does exist and we can add to our own light within us um, by doing and reading and participating in good things. And intrinsically, we sort of know what these good things are, um, you know, obviously serving other people. And I, I talk about that a lot in my book about serving other people, helping other people, reaching out to other people and, and doing those things. Um, but also reading good literature, wholesome literature, or, or seeing good films or, um, things that uplift the soul. Um, I, I really believe very strongly that there is a spiritual light that does exist and that we have the ability to tap into that by what we do and what we consume um, and what we participate in. And so, you know, on top of uh, doing things to recover from uh, depression and um seeing a therapist and taking medication if that's what you need to do. I, I think that there is a real power that comes to us as we, as we seek out a spiritual light, um, you know, participating in, in good things and consuming good content. Wonderful. It's almost a plug for Nonfiction for Life where we talk about insightful, inspiring, and um, uplifting books. That's our mission here. So that people can, you know, look to a source to find literature that will help them and bring light into their lives. So thank you for yeah. that. We appreciate yeah. talking with you today, and we wish you well in your future writings and your endeavors to help people who are struggling with similar depression. And we hope that you'll continue to write for us. Thank you, Seth. Well, thank you. Thank you, Janet. The book is... Your Life is Not for You, A Selfish Person's Guide to Being Selfless. You can find links to Seth's book at nonfictionforlife.com in the show notes for the podcast. I'm your host, Janet Perry, and you've been listening to the Nonfiction for Life podcast. We hope you enjoyed our show. Remember, if you love reading compelling true stories and books with great ideas for living well, but you have little time to hunt them down, we're here to help. If you like what you heard today and would like to hear from more nonfiction authors, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes. You can also sign up for our email updates for reviews of other books. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at Nonfiction for Life and to join in the conversation on our Facebook page. You'll discover long-standing classics, some hidden gems, and a few hot-off-the-press new releases. Whatever you choose... You can count on all of our recommendations being insightful, inspiring, and uplifting. We aim to bring good books to life because when it comes to nonfiction, we believe there's something for everyone. Thanks for listening.